pay attention to what makes you jealous or envious. Ooh. So, and so what I realized was I wasn't looking at like, let's say people who were selling more books or people who were speaking at more events. I was like desperately uh, jealous of people who like slept a full night's sleep or sometimes took naps or people who talked about their lives feeling like sort of light and um, right sized and people who weren't complaining about being tired and busy all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of a, that's a signal right there. You know, I wanted their life and Mm -hmm. it didn't look anything like my life. So I think paying attention to the people that make you jealous can sometimes show you what it is you really desire. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Better Together. When you know better, you get better. Our quote of the day comes from our guest today. It's easy to be liked by strangers. It's very hard to be loved and connected to the people in your home when you're always bringing them your most exhausted self and resenting the fact that the scraps you're giving them aren't cutting it. Ooh! Damn, Shauna Nequest, our guest today, she's the New York Times bestselling author of Present Over Perfect, Leaving Behind Frantic for a Simpler, More Soulful Way of Living. The foreword is by our favorite, Brene Brown. Um, so excited to chat with her today. Um, in the meantime, thank you guys for joining us. As always, if you haven't clips, clicked subscribe on YouTube, please help us and help yourself so you can get all the notifications so you never miss an incredible episode. Uh, follow us at Better Together with Maria on uh, social media. Yes. Yes. Kelsey's all over that. Uh, and if you haven't joined us on Patreon, please do. Along with the ad-free content, um, your investment there will also bring you more content, exclusive content that we do there, and these incredible exclusive workshops that we are just starting to curate with our guests. So you have access to the amazing guests you get to see on the main show. Um, you actually have access to them in these workshops. And so we're really excited. <clears throat> All right. Let's get to our conversation Yay. with Shauna Nequest. She is a best-selling author, lecturer, and thought leader in contemporary Christianity and spirituality. She has shared the stage with so many impressive peers like Oprah, Brene Brown, who we are desperately trying to get on this show, a uh, former guest of ours who we love, Glennon Doyle. Speaking of Glennon, she cried tears of relief while reading Shauna's most recent book, Present Over Perfect, which stresses the importance of leaving behind perfection to embrace the simple beauty uh, of, of, to embrace the simple, the beauty of simply being alive. Damn, <laughs> I've like you lost my train of thought <laughs> right here and right now. Um, so everybody, welcome Shauna to the show. How are you? Hey, thanks for having me. Of this course. I'm so excited to talk to you. I feel like um, we should probably start with your story that got you to uh, presence in your own life. And obviously now you're, you know, sharing it with everybody else. Uh, there was a season several years ago where I think like if you and I had gone out for coffee and you would have and you would have asked me what really matters to you most, I would have said, oh, you know, obviously my faith, my family, my marriage, my kids, um, really being deeply connected to the people I love, making memories. I would have told you all of these things. But if you looked <clears throat> at the actual day to day of my life, I think you would have seen that what mattered to me essentially was like work and hustling and running errands and being busy all the time to reach some sort of imaginary place where I finally had done enough. Mm. I pushed myself for so many years um, for all sorts of reasons. And then I got to a point where I said, wait a minute, my life doesn't actually match my values anymore. And I'm not the person I want to be. And I need to make some changes. So how did you get to that place? Because for me, it was a brain tumor. You know, I think, uh, obviously, there are invitations all around us. Mm-hmm. And something like a brain tumor is such a, a dramatic invitation. And I'm so glad that you're doing well and that your health is thriving. And um, what an enormous thing to enter someone's life. Um, 
I had nothing so dramatic. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like there were just little whispers everywhere, you know, but I didn't listen to them mm -hmm. because I was too busy. So I didn't listen to the whispers and then I didn't listen to like the regular voice. And then I didn't listen to the shouting and then I didn't listen to the screaming. And then uh, I finally started to pay attention when it was like, I couldn't hear or feel anything. Mm. I was so exhausted and so kind of burned out on such a deep level that it felt like I was watching my actual life from behind a thick pane of glass. Does that make sense? Yeah. Wow. That is such a great description. You know, we get so wrapped up in the rat race of life, right? And especially as women, we have to be everything to everyone and we're nothing to ourselves. And... I feel like it really is just about our to-do list every day. It's like, we got to get it done. We got to get it done. And are you, are you helping me get done, honey? No? Okay, now we're going to, you know, stressful moments with each other because I got to get it done. Why aren't you wanting to get it done? Because we're obviously very different. Um, and, and yeah, I talk about it all the time. I was moving so lightning fast that I wasn't hearing any of the whispers, screams, punches to the face, kicks to the gut until... You know, God was like, okay, let me body slam you with a brain tumor and let's shut this down because you have a journey you need to go on and you're not listening. And so I applaud you for not having to get ill. A lot of people have to get ill to have that moment. Um, so at what point and how were you able to realize that your life didn't align with your values? Because I think that's so fascinating to look at it like that. I think um, I started to really, I mean, you notice anything, you, a friend of mine, a mentor of mine, who's so wise, always says that none of us, well, very rarely, do you change your life until the pain level gets high enough. Mm -hmm. And so I started to experience that kind of pain or friction in all different areas of my life. My health was not great. I was not sleeping well. I couldn't manage my weight. My marriage was not where I wanted it to be. My parenting was not where I wanted it to be. My work life felt pretty like hollow and frantic. And it, it, it took some honesty on my part to say, this might look okay from the outside, but on the inside, things look really, really bad. And I think I just got, uh, one of the things I think that's also helpful sometimes is to pay attention to what makes you jealous or envious. Ooh. So, and so what I realized was I wasn't looking at like, let's say people who were selling more books or people who were speaking at more events. I was like desperately uh, jealous of people who like slept a full night's sleep or sometimes took naps or people who talked about their lives feeling like sort of light and um, right sized and people who weren't complaining about being tired and busy all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of a, that's a signal right there. You know, I wanted their life and mm -hmm. it didn't look anything like my life. So I think paying attention to the people that make you jealous can sometimes show you what it is you really desire. Oh my God. I mean, it's so obvious, but, but not right. Like even this past weekend, I had a moment where I just was like on a walk. I really love like having neighborhoods and talking to neighbors. So I have neighbors on both coasts that I love and I, I've made an effort to know everybody. Um, so I was walking down the street and, you know, this neighbor's dog that I love, I was playing with him on the lawn and the kids were out and they were riding the tractor and climbing trees. And I was like, that's the life I want for my kids, right? When I have them. That's what I want. I want peace. I want simplicity. I love driving my parents' minivan and having a simple life. Like it's just where what I'm wearing doesn't matter, where things I'm driving don't matter, just the simplicity. I mean, listen, I love great things. Of course, everybody likes nice things, but I don't need them. I need my sanity and my inner peace. And so I think that's such a great tip to really look at what is making you envious? Because one of the things that I've always had envy over is people who can just have fun on the weekends and like live life. I didn't know how to do that because I was so stuck in work, 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 that even just now being here in Connecticut over the last two and a half, three months, I'm realizing that's what I've been missing. Those friends where you can just be like, hey, let's go apple picking this weekend, or let's just hang out and watch a movie. I didn't have that life in LA. In LA, it was all 
work events, industry events, we're going, we're going to be seen, we have to dress to the nines. I was so exhausted by that lifestyle. Um, having a smidge of it is fine, but having it be your everything 24 seven, it's just too much. I, I mean, I can't imagine, but I, I do know that in my life, part of, you know, part of my work life was I worked weekends every weekend for years. And I think sometimes maybe there were people who looked at me and they were like, wow, what like a cool, fancy job. But I was doing exactly like what you were saying. Like, I want to go apple picking. I want to like play in the yard. I want to wear like my jammies till noon. (laughs) And those are good signals to pay attention to um, because they'll lead us to our true desires. Even though obviously we live in a culture that says, you know, work is so valuable because, and also because work makes you important and work lets, lets you buy fancy things. And that's what we should all want. But I think under that cultural messaging of work and buying and spending and accumulating, if we can get out from under that voice, if we can turn down the volume of that voice, we find that a lot of times what we want is a lot simpler than Mm -hmm. that, uh, is a lot less expensive than that, is a lot less flashy than that. And I think those are the voices that are really worth listening to. Yeah. Well, you are such a great example of that because you're, you and your husband and your family moved from the burbs to the city in New York. You downsized to the teeniest little space. (laughs) That is true. (laughs) And so I'd love for you to share with people the motivation behind that and the pros and cons, because right now I feel like everyone's doing the opposite. Everyone's like, get out of the city, move to the burbs, need land, need yard, need all of this stuff because we're going to be stuck at home. And you guys did the complete opposite. Well, I mean, (laughs) certainly we didn't realize we would be spending quite as many hours in the apartment (laughs) as we are, obviously. But, you know, good point. Um, the decision was pre-COVID. Right, right. Yeah. Um, sometimes when people ask, like, what on earth are you doing here? Like, why did you move to New York when you were like 42 years old? And sometimes the way I explain it is I moved for love um, because my husband uh, has been wanting to move for 10 years. We both grew up in the same hometown, lived in the same hometown for a long time. And for the last 10 years, every year he asked me, is this our year for an adventure? Is this our year for an adventure? And every year I was like, do you mean a trip? And he was like, I don't. You're like, please, like dear trips. God, mean a trip. Right. <laughs> I'll even do two. Totally. And I love to travel. So that part always felt fun. But I really, I, I think I had a pretty deeply embedded idea of what our future was going to look like. And it was going to be in our hometown with our extended family, with our old friends. Um, I, like I thought I knew what the future looked like and write famous last words. Um, he kept saying, I think there's another way for us to live. And I think it's more about creativity and simplicity. I think we want to be in a really arts oriented place. Um, I want to raise our kids in a really diverse environment. And so uh, really a friend of mine always says you make the best decisions when your bravery just outweighs your fear. Ooh. Right? You're you're afraid and then all of a sudden you just get like a little just enough bravery to kind of make the move. And that's that's kind of what happened. And so we sold our house and sold tons of our stuff and gave away a bunch of stuff and moved to an 825 square foot, square foot apartment. Um and we love it. Like we totally love it and Um, I think now if we went back to a big house in the suburbs, we'd be like, where is everybody? We've gotten really used to living kind of right on top of each other. We get a lot of time together. We don't have to spend a lot of time managing our stuff because there isn't much stuff. It's been really great. That's been a great adventure. Is managing all the stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like the more, you know, I think was it Biggie who said more money, more problems, (laughs) right? But it's like the more stuff you have the more you have to worry about. And that's that's a challenge. I mean, for someone like me, I love land. I love feeling the infinity of a yard, right? So I'm here mm-hmm. in Connecticut and I feel infinity here like you feel at the beach, right? I just see woods and I, I don't know how far out they go. I just know it goes out. And I love that feeling. It makes me so happy. But I also really envy people who live in small condos, where you take the Swiffer and you're done in five minutes 
and your life is just so simple that you can just focus on everything your heart desires rather than, okay, I got the plumber coming today. I got the electrician coming tomorrow. Shit, this broke, that broke. Got to get the lawn mowed. I got to do this. I got to do that. And you're like, ah, it's such a conflicting thing. And so maybe it's the Gemini in me that wants both things. But um, I think there will be a time where I will do the same. Well, and I think it doesn't have to be like, we probably won't live here forever. I mean, we love it. I kind of hope we do, but, um, and it doesn't have to be the same for everyone. So like my husband and I, when we were, let's say like newly married, we were like 26, we moved to Michigan and we bought a big old house that was built in 1920 that needed to be like completely redone. And then we realized we don't know how to do anything and we don't like it. <laughs> like this is this is terrible. <laughs> we are the wrong candidates for this. We're like really, really great candidates for apartment living. You know, I, I like to live in a small space. I like that you can clean it up in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. I can't fix anything, you know, um, but it doesn't have to. There's no, that's another big part of this for me. There's no one right way for each of us for every season. A lot of what I'm really passionate about is having conversations about listening to uh, what our own lives are telling us, mm -hmm. right? What's right for you in this season for your family? And it doesn't have to look exactly like your neighbors or exactly like my neighbors or, you know, we get to craft the lives that we feel really excited about, the things that feel meaningful to us, even if they don't matter to other people. Yeah. And, and I love when you use the term seasons because it gives people um, permission to realize that this could just be a season. Like, why does everything have to be so finite? Why? I think even with your, with who you are, right? Like, we're always like, this is who I am. And it's like, well, why can't you grow? Why can't you be a little different? Why can't friends be friends in this season and not in the next season? It doesn't mean that you're a bad person. I've been having this conversation a lot with people lately where they feel guilt when the friendships have run their course. And I was like, well, haven't you heard of the analogy of like shaking the tree? Like, it's okay to move on. You don't have to be hateful. You don't have to be negative. You don't have to tell them that, well, you're this, 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 and this, and that's why we can't. It's like, no, it's a different season. Like, I'm interested in different things. And I want to be, you know, pursuing friendships with people who have those similar interests or whatever the case is. But when you use seasons, there's like a permission slip involved in there that I love. I think it's so helpful for us, um, yeah, to let ourselves try new things, to let ourselves fail, to let ourselves take risks. You know, if if you have to decide at like whatever age someone decides is like grown up age, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're like, the cement is dried and you have to keep living that life forever. It feels really scary to me. Um, one of the things that we really loved um, about moving to the city. So my husband and I have never lived in a city. We visited lots of cities, but we've always lived in small towns and suburbs. And when we got here, there was just so much we didn't know how to do. We were just like rookies in every way. <laughs> and we made mistakes constantly. <clears throat> and we screwed things up constantly. My, I was like 30% of the time I could take the right subway. I mean, I just got lost constantly with my kids who even, I mean, I ended up in other boroughs. I could never get my laundry done. I always bought too many groceries and I couldn't <laughs> um, get them all up the stairs, you know, cause I'm used to having like a car. Um, and at first it was really, really frustrating. And then it started to become really freeing. And we were like, we get to be learners again, yeah. right? If you can keep learning, <clears throat> life feels really exciting. Mm -hmm. If you can reframe it, um, and it's not like I am failing every single day, but it's I'm learning a new skill set every day. And we're, we're becoming more curious and more capable people. I think that's an exciting way to live. Absolutely. So, so cool. Um, you know, one of the things that um, you talk about is being okay with disappointing some people, right? So if you're choosing present over perfect, um, one of the notions I feel like women carry is that we have to be the perfect friend, the perfect mom, the perfect sister, the perfect everything. And that weight is very heavy on our shoulders and we don't want to disappoint anyone. Will you talk a little bit about your circles and how you kind of got to the place where you realize it's got to, it's got to be okay for your sanity to disappoint people and how you choose that. Absolutely. I, um, I think a lot of us who find ourselves kind of exhausted, burnt out, frantic, 
especially women, especially in kind of midlife, um, it's because we've bought into several different cultural myths. And one of them is if you do everything exactly right, you will never disappoint anyone. Well, that's just a lie. The way it works is there's a certain amount of time and a certain amount of energy and it does run out. It is finite. And so some people, when you say yes to one thing, you are inherently saying yes, saying no to something else. And so the people that you're giving this time to are not the people that you're going to be giving this time to. It just like it's math. So you have to decide if I'm going to give up the myth that I can do it all for everyone. What that means is admitting the ugly reality that some people are going to be disappointed, which is like terrifying for me. Mm -hmm. Like I hate that thought. But okay. If reality, as much as I don't like it, is that somebody's going to be disappointed. What that means is I get to decide who I'm going to disappoint and who I'm not. And so what I thought about is in this terrible new reality, who am I willing to disappoint and who am I unwilling to disappoint? And so I thought about it in terms of if you picture like a bullseye, picture like concentric circles and at the center it's my husband and I and our two boys. That's it. That's the center. And then it's like maybe my parents or a couple of very best friends. Then it's like my in-laws, extended family, really close friends. Then we're getting into like school friends, colleagues. Then we're like, you know, that lady I see sometimes at the playground. You go all the way out from there, right? Mm -hmm. The mistake I made for so many years was thinking if I managed to do things just absolutely perfectly, every person in all of these circles would always be happy. Yeah. But you're probably good enough where you did because I feel like I was pretty good at keeping everybody happy over here. And my circles are insane and filled with so many people. There's a lot of overcrowding in these circles. And then what you realize is you neglect the inner circle because they'll the take thing. it. That's the thing. That was a, a real moment of clarity for me, realizing that I was often giving the best of my energy to people in the circles that were further out, and I was forsaking the people in the center circle. And that's probably my biggest regret when I look back at that season of my life. Right now, I don't know if I'm getting, I'm certainly not getting everything right, but I know that I'm giving the best of my energy, the best of my soul, the best of my spirit to my husband and my kids uh, because I got close enough to that edge to get a little bit scared and I'm not doing that again. Mm. I know that the best of what I have to give, the best love, the most attentiveness, the most connection, that goes to those three people. And then whatever's left, which is a lot less than I previously thought, it goes to the people in the corresponding close circles. And it's terrifying sometimes to have to like look someone in the eye and say like, I am not going to do that thing or I'm not going to attend that event or I am not going to sign up for that. That's hard for me, mm -hmm. but it it's, I'm getting better at disappointing people on the outer side, outsides of the circle because I'm so deeply committed to not doing it to my kids or to my husband anymore. I think that's incredible and such great perspective that we all need to focus on. And I wonder like when you make these circles, right? How do you, like in life, I feel like we're all here to help each other, right? I think that that's, you know, that's how I approach life. And so if I can, I will, but of I'll course. often overdo it because I think, I don't know, I think I have a superhero cape on my back. It's like invisible. And I think all women pretty much feel the same way. Totally. So how do you, how do you not kind of, you know, I mean, listen, I get the circles, but I still find it hard if I say no to Kelsey and she needs me. When I need her one day, she's going to be like, sorry, peace out. You didn't help me. I can't help you. And so we do need each other, right? Um, and if you just keep it so close, it's going to be challenging in life when, you know, your colleagues who now may have a job somewhere else and you want to reach out to them and get their help, if you didn't show up for something that was important for them, but then what happens is you can get so overwhelmed. Like I was everywhere for everything, making sure I didn't disappoint people. Of course, I disappointed people along the way because you can really only do so much. But damn, I tried really hard. But yeah, you 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 hurt the people you're closest with. So how do you do? Well, you know what? How do we do it all? <laughs> <laughs> Shit, that's where that's I'm going back question. to. Oh, well, I think a couple things to think about are um, sort of like 
what's the proportional amount of time or energy given all these circles, right? Like one of the things I get wrong, my husband teases me about this all the time. I could meet someone twice um, and spend like, you know, an hour with them total. And then I get a wedding invitation. I'm like, yeah, definitely. I am definitely flying to another part of the country Mm -hmm. to attend their wedding. I'm I'm definitely going to go to a shower. I'll probably host a shower. Like I go all the way. And my husband's like, you know, that person is essentially a stranger, right? Like you're, this is crazy town. So what I think about is like, who would I, who are the appropriate people for me to do that for, right? Fly across the country, host a shower, Mm sister-in-law, college roommate, right? A couple, but not lady I met on a plane. Yeah. There has to be some sort of like, um, I think that's where the circles are really helpful. You give the best and the most to the inside and then you give appropriately less and less to the outside. Doesn't mean nothing. I probably still keep the circles, keep too many people in the circles and do too much. The other thing that helps me is I ask myself, if I don't do this, who will? And oftentimes I'm taking a really great opportunity from someone else by trying to be that superhero in everybody's life, in everybody's business, right? So like nobody else can be a mom to my boys. That's my job. That's my jam. That's my greatest joy. But like, there are a lot of things in life that need to get done, but I don't have to be the one to do it. And somebody else might gain a lot of joy or meaning from doing that thing. Mm -hmm. If I pull back on my savior complex and let them do it a little bit, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I was just kind of thinking too, what I have done in the last four years when, you know, my mom got sick and we've been dealing with all this stuff is I started omitting things that were just overwhelming. And I was like, people who love me are going to love me despite like I cancel Christmas gifts. I was like, can't do Christmas cards, can't do Christmas gifts. I'm so sorry. Um, And then I did lessen a lot of the events and what I would do instead. So someone wanted me to come to a charity event, I'd say, you know, I can't make it, but I can send something or I can do this. So I would tell them what I could do. So then, you know, you're still helping and you're still being, you know, gracious in that moment, but like doing what's within your ability at that time. So, and I think, I think some of what that does is it keeps you healthier and more able to like in that season, you know, meet your mom's needs and be a, a, the family member that you needed to be. What it also does is it communicates to the other people in your life, a little bit of permission to not say yes to everything as well. Mm-hmm. Right. It's so helpful for me when I'm around people who say stuff like that, who say like, Hey, I totally care about this. I can only contribute in this way because of the other things I'm already um, committed to. I'm like, well, that person seems extremely sane and I want to be like them. <laughs> I so am I envious. It, it, totally. <laughs> but it's contagious. It lets yeah. us all make healthier decisions. So I think it's it's important for each of us and our own like health and lives and families. It's also a gift we give to the people around us to say like, I'm not going to pretend that it's okay to say yes to everything and then end up burnt out and exhausted. Yeah. I'm going to steward my own life and energy in a responsible and loving way. And I want to make it easier for you to do that too. I love that. Before we move on from that, do you guys have any questions? Because I feel like it's such an important topic that um, if I miss something, I don't want to miss it for our audience. So if you guys have any follow-ups to that. You know, I think Shauna, like as a young career person right now, and you know, I work in media, you worked in media, well, still work in media. Do you have advice for especially young people who want to put up boundaries um, professionally. And I'm in a fortunate position where I work for someone great, where this isn't usually a problem, but I know a lot of people, it's Maria can see that I'm in an interesting position right now. Oh yeah. I do this on air, but, I get um, but, on. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm wondering if you have advice for young people who want to draw boundaries, especially professionally on those outside circles, but still be respected and everything they need to be for their, for their work. Mm. I think that's a great question. And I would say a couple different things. I would say, you know, um, we set people's expectations for us um, by the way that we communicate. So when I get an email from someone at three in the morning, I'm like, note to self, that person thinks I should be returning emails at three o'clock in the morning as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to do that. But in my 20s, I absolutely did, especially if I thought that if that person was kind of important in some way. Um, 
start now cultivating the habits of communication and interaction that show people I'm not on my phone 24 hours a day. I'm not going to get back to you. You know, when, when someone returns your texts in four seconds all the time, then you've trained them, right? Say like, I literally live with my phone in my hand. So if there's ways for you to communicate clearly and consistently, that kind of thing. The other thing, it's always helpful for me to think about things as a long game. There's so much, especially in media, where it's like that very, like, if you say no, someone else is going to get it. And then like, they're going to be the next big thing and you miss the boat. For my life as as a writer, I want to be a writer till the day I die. And I hope that's a really long time from now. I'm not trying to do the next big thing right now. I'm trying to build something durable and beautiful for like the next 50 years. Mm. And if I miss out on a couple things right now, that's okay with me. Mm. If I burn out and risk my health and my family, that's not okay with me. Mm. So I always think about the long game. Well, such a great example of that in our business is like actors who said no to massive roles, but they still had huge careers. Totally. I love those stories. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's challenging, though, for young people in the industry, because I always have a hard time advising them because I would not be where I was if I didn't respond every second. And if I didn't hustle and if I didn't work 24 seven, I would not have gotten to where I did because succeeding in any industry at the level you want to succeed at really requires a commitment that goes above and beyond what the other people are going to do. Right. And so I find like, when you're starting off, you have to give to get, you have to get there. And then what happens is at some point we all, we get over that kind of hump and then we can look at our lives in this season now and say, okay, well, I don't want to take on as many acting roles this, this season, right? Like that's where like an Angelina Jolie becomes an international star. And she's like, yeah, I want to take a step back. I want to do just the meaningful projects. I want to start directing. Like you can't have it all right? Like when you talk about even being envious of other people. So it doesn't mean that you're saying, okay, look at everything you're envious of and then shut down your life so that you can have that because there are consequences. You still got to pay your bills. You still got to go to work. Like what happens is it's such a challenge for us in our positions and at our age to advise young people because I don't know if Maria at 27 would be Maria 42 if she didn't do what she did then. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm very confused. I I totally get what you're saying. Absolutely. And I've had people say that, like, you know, like how lovely of for you to say now you're going to slow everything down Yeah. now that you've got a nice established relationship with a publisher. Now that you've got a nice contract. Absolutely. I totally get that. Uh, Maybe this is a little more um, jaded. I tend to think that, um, when you're on the younger side, you take like one tenth of the advice you're given anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and say it and just trust that. That's like great. I would say, especially, uh, especially in terms of dating, like whenever anyone asks me dating advice, I was like, you know what you're going to do, don't you? Yeah. You're not going to listen to me at all. Totally. Are you? So true. <laughs> there's, there's a lot about youth that's sort of indestructible and, and invincible. And so I'm happy to give advice, but I, I will absolutely still continue to get emails at three o'clock in the morning from people and be like, okay, it's fine. You can do that when you're 25 and you'll figure it out along the way. I know. Well, it's interesting because my husband will get on me sometimes because he's like, you get so fruity on the show and you're like, oh, the universe is going to give you what you want. He's like, there's realities in life. You got to work hard. And so I have to temper myself sometimes because he's right. Like there is like no getting around if you want, like, listen, there are different levels. If you say, "Mm, this is where I want to be, there's no, you know, but if you want to be in the upper echelon of your field, whether it's in, you know, medical field or engineering or industry, there's just no getting around it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's fun to have that conversation too. So, but I I think it also comes down to what you're willing to give up along the way. Mm -hmm. Right. So Jeff, if your question was um, my highest or my only priority is my career. It's the Mm. only thing I care about and I want to be the absolute top of my field. Okay. Then, then yes, hold your phone in your hand for the rest of your life and never be unreachable. And and you can probably do that. But if you say, I value my career very much and I'm going to work really, really hard. I also value my marriage and my core relationships. And so I'm going to find a way... um, 
to give uh, the, the appropriate amount to each of those things in their seasons and moments, that's a really different thing. Mm -hmm. Because some of what you wanted for your life was not just the work stuff. You wanted a marriage and a full life and, and, and fulfilling relationships. And so I think it's important anytime we make decisions about our time, what is it you really want and what matters to you? And it's okay mm -hmm. if it's not the same as everybody else, yeah. but to acknowledge the things that matter most, I think helps us in making those hard decisions. And it's never so going to be perfect, right? Like you're going to have, like I always say, like ebbs and flows of like, we run red and then you you can, you always. know, go down. So it's like, Jeff, if anybody I know, like of anybody I know, I feel like you have been the most balanced mm -hmm. and you've also grown and, and um, along your journey as well. So like you hold your values in high regard already. Well, Very that's good. Fun. I, um... I really appreciate that. And I think part of that is learning from the great people on this show. And you know, what's interesting, Shauna, I feel like part of what you're saying is like your concentric circles can also change too. Like when you're in your young twenties, maybe some of those professional relationships are a little closer than they will be mm -hmm. as you age, mm -hmm. but just being so intentional all the time, taking stock of those circles, taking stock of those values and pacing your future, really taking that intentionality to think about that's what's so important. There is a book that I am crazy about. Um, do you guys know Patrick Lencioni? No. no. And he's a, he's, he would be great on the show. He's so just a wonderful, lovely person. He's written several books on like the business side, of, business and leadership side of things. But then he wrote a, a book about, and of course, I don't know the title off the top of my head, but it's something like the five questions every family should answer or that, but it, essentially there's this funny story that he tells that he's big into like, what are your priorities for your team? What are the goals that your team wants to meet in this quarter? What are the, you know, whatever. He's really good at that on a business level. And then his wife said to him at a certain point, if we ran, if you ran your business, the way we run this family, you'd be out of business in, in quarter one or something like that. And he realized that he didn't have the same kind of plan and strategy and, and value process for their family life that he had for his business life. And so they applied these principles to their family life. And it was so great. And I would totally recommend it. But one of the things they talk about is understanding what this particular season is about and therefore not about. So like when I say I don't reply to emails at three o'clock in the morning, well, I absolutely do if it's the week of a book release. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course I do. Mm. Um, but I absolutely don't if in the seasons when I had a newborn and that was the most important thing in my life. And so I think it's, mm. it's really good to get clear on what matters most in this season and to let it shift, to give the best of what you have for the particular thing that you're working toward right then. That Oof. is perfect, even though we're not aiming for perfect, but I think <laughs> that is such a great way to explain that. Mm-hmm. Oh, drop the mic. I have a quick question, Shauna. Mm -hmm. How, how many, okay. If you have a ton of things you value, what would you say is like the perfect amount, right? Because I feel like if you have four or five things, I'm like, I love this. I value this. I value this. You can't do it all, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like you two were both talking about this at the beginning, being a female. It's like, no, we can. We have to do it all. How do you go about like being selective, with your values? That's a great question. Um, and I would, I would say, uh, pay attention, uh, uh, pay attention to a couple things, right? Pay attention to your own jealousy and desire. Um, one thing that helped me many years ago, uh, was making a list, uh, sort of in the opposite direction of things that for this particular season, I don't do. Mm. Like I just, you know, I wanted to do 1 million different things. And I had to just say, I just had to draw some lines. Here's what I don't do. And when I looked at that list, it gave me a little freedom to say, I'm, I'm acknowledging that I am not going to get everything done in this season. Um, and I'm going to let myself be okay with that. Um, and it sounded like a little bit of a silly list, but like in this season right now, I don't do any sort of like formal cardio or weightlifting. And I just figure like, Walking around New York City and getting my groceries up the stairs is going to have to be enough for now. And maybe in another season, I'll do that in a really specific way. For a long time, I had a very strict no baking policy. I don't know how to do it. I'm not good at science. I mess it up all the time. I don't have the time and mental space in my life to learn this thing. So until I was like you know, 40, I never did. And now I have kids and they like to like bake cookies and stuff. And so now I do. 
Mm. But it's okay to say, I also don't make my bed. Like not ever, ever in my life. It looks like a dorm room in here. If you, if I turned around the camera, it's like, I don't even know. Oh no, do like it. a Kelsey cheering over here. I'm trying to get her to make her bed. I'm like Kelsey, you got to make your bed. Your life will be so much happier. I totally get it. I People do it. People love it. It makes them feel good about their day. It categorically, categorically doesn't matter to me. If I make my bed or don't make my bed, it doesn't make me feel better about anything in the world. <laughs> Oh, so I just don't. My God. <laughs> right there with you. <laughs> Dead. That's hilarious. That's funny. Well, Shauna, this has been such a great conversation. I've gotten so much out of it. Um, I'm feverishly taking notes here. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. I feel like we need to do um, another part to this because there's so much more to get into, um, even with, you know, faith and stuff. So um, hopefully you'll grace us with another presence at some point. Anytime. This has been so fun. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh my God. I, there's so many big aha moments mm-hmm. I got to have in this episode that I'm going to have to listen back to my, to the whole thing myself as just a, a listener. Um, so I can't thank you enough. If you guys want to um, get the book, it's called Present Over Perfect. Um, if you want to find more about Shauna, you can hit her website, shaunanequest.com. We will put that in the summary of this episode, so you can just click. Um, and you can follow her on social media, at Shauna Nequest. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. All right, guys. Holy moly. I mean, wow. there's like so many moments. She's Kelsey's so awesome. never making her bed again. That's <laughs> no, it. No, it's, it's, it's so It's fun. over. <laughs> it's so, it's <laughs> It's funny that she says that because a lot of things you try and teach me and you have been telling me, I totally get like the wiping down my space and this and that. The bed thing, I'm the same way. I'm like, and to me, it's like the easiest thing. You just pull the corners, boom, done. It's easy, but it's like I never go in there. So like it doesn't even, you really don't go in there. No, I go in there. Yeah. I go into my room a lot. Yeah. And I never have been a room person. I don't like going, Mm. it's like not my space. So, so I know that okay, was funny, but, but she's amazing. Stupid she's, shit aside, yeah, 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 yeah. The, <laughs> the important shit. Um, I feel like, like the seasons oh my God. and what you do and you don't do. Um, I marked so many things here for social media for you guys, but man, I really that was so good. And ooh. the way she explained finally kind of that, you know, yes, like in, in important moments, she is going to answer that email at three o'clock in the morning. Like, you know, it's like, there's no way you can't sometimes. Right. And so, um, like right in this season right now, in this season, I'm checking emails more than I was in my last season. Why? Cause there's a few more things happening. And so now I'm having to pay a little bit more attention to it, but I have an email that tells you I'm not checking emails. Right. Exactly. And in this season, I am a little bit more engaged in social media. Um, but in the last season I wasn't. So I think it's so great to free ourselves of the, what I am and what I'm not to kind of just, this is what's important to me in this time, Mm. right? Like if we have kids, like there's going to be a shifting of priorities in that time. And then eventually maybe they'll swing the other way again. I don't know. Yeah. I get suspicious of those people who are like, I never answer emails after 6 PM because like, I get that maybe like most of the time you don't, but to hear the author of the book present over perfect say like, there might be a week out of the year where I do do that. Right. It's just not my MO. I think mm-hmm. that's so important. Yeah. I think there's like baseline things like baseline boundaries mm-hmm. that you have to have in life. Yep. And then you choose, like she said, who you might cross that boundary list for and for what reason. Right. Um, so I think like I've be- tried to become more intentional about not, um, not texting people at all hours of the night or whatever. Like if I get a thought, like it's hard. I used to just dump it and now I'm like, okay, I'll just put it in my email and then I'll save it and then I'll send it at a more appropriate time. I really am trying to be better at that. And that's been a a little journey for a while now. I have to tell you that I love that and I appreciate that because with old bosses, that used to make me so crazy because it would be like 12 and I'm like, 
ah, then it, I'm sitting on it and I'm like, now I don't know what to do with it. But I see it from both sides. I do because it's like, you have to dump it out of your you head, have to. but there's a way to do it. Like, Correct. but I didn't yeah. know because I was under those systems too, where yeah. that's who I was learning from. Yep. So I thought it was just, this is how it's done. Like, yep. don't answer it if you can't answer it, but, mm-hmm. but you do answer it. And then if you don't respond right then, then you lose it. Yep. And so, yep. You know, now I've become more intentional about how I approach that stuff. And mm-hmm. I think, listen, we're all on a journey and yep. that's why we're trying to get better every day. And so when you know better, you do better Dang right. and you get better. So that is our show for today. Hope you guys have um, an amazing day. I hope you guys enjoyed this. If it was helpful, share it with some friends. Um, I know this episode was helpful for me. So um, please share it with your friends on social media, email, Talk to them about it. Um, I think there's some really important takeaway here for everybody to benefit from. Um, if you liked this episode, check out episode number 117 with Shauna's friend, Glennon Doyle, who we love, who also stresses the importance of finding your own way. Stick with us, guys. We're going to be here every day. Yeah. <laughs> In the meantime, follow us at Shauna Nequest, at Better Together with Maria, at Jeffrey Cranegram, at Kel Smyer, too. And remember... remember be nice people make good choices and be present